Poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. What is happening, you future world beater, you? Welcome to Chasing Poker Greatness, where I'm very blessed and grateful to be able to sit down with some of the greatest minds on the green felt and ask them the questions that are going to give you valuable insights and wisdom on your own journey to poker immortality. I'm your host, founder of EnhanceYourEdge.com, Brad Wilson, and today I'm talking with a good friend of mine, Jesse Yaganuma. Jesse's been playing poker professionally since 2006, he started his career in Maryland on the East Coast, but has called sunny California home for the last eight years. Jesse's a world-class player in both cash games, his specialty, where him and I first crossed paths and he promptly crushed me in a $10,000 pot, and tournaments with $1.9 million in lifetime winnings, despite playing a very limited schedule. As with any poker player, things haven't always gone Jesse's way, and he'll explain how he deals with the blissful upswings and the horrible existential crisis causing downswings that come with a career of playing cards. Jesse has a natural interest in psychology and is extremely driven to learn all he can about the why behind human beings and the things that they do. He shares his wisdom on what you can do to keep your mind right, what he does to optimize his own mental health and the sheer physical energy that your brain consumes when you take on a task as mentally draining as poker. Jesse has a well-founded reputation for being one of the calmest people you'll ever meet at the poker table, no matter where he plays, a testament to his envious ability to always keep his head in the game and emotions in check. As we talk today, you'll learn how he started his poker career, the super valuable tools and lessons he's used for growth, and how he rejuvenated his game after realizing he had grown a little stagnant over the years. He'll talk about the importance of having a good network of people around you, how he feels about some of the most common modern poker advice, and what wisdom he'd give himself if he could go back in time. He also keeps mostly to himself on social media. While you might see tons of pros all over poker forums, Twitter, and Instagram, Jesse stays fairly quiet and goes about his business mostly under the radar, except when he's sitting at a WPT final table, of course. And given his personality and outlook on life, that makes 100% sense to me. So saddle in and gear up for this rare opportunity to consume some value hand grenades from a world-class poker combatant. Without any further ado, I bring to you my conversation with Jesse Yaganuma. Jesse, my man, how you doing, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, long time no see. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. It has been way too long that I've sort of disappeared from live poker altogether and battling on the virtual felt. Let's let's kick this kick this off by let's talk about your poker journey. You know, just in the, the our pre-show conversation, you mentioned you've been in L.A. for like, what, eight years now? Yeah, going on a little over eight years now. Moved wow. here right after uh, Black Friday in 2011. Yeah, yeah. And um, been here ever since. So let's go, let's go back. Let's go back to Maryland, pre-L.A. Jesse days. Just a kid, just a kid in Maryland trying to find his way. <laughs> oh, yeah. There were lots of us back then. <laughs> Tell, tell me the story of how you got into uh, into playing cards for a living. You know, for me, I actually didn't play poker at all growing up. Um, unlike some people, like some kids, some guys played like poker with their dads or grandparents their whole life, like really young. But I didn't play until college at all. First time I played poker was freshman year in my, my dorm room with a few friends for like five bucks. I had never heard of Texas Hold'em. And I think the first time I played, you know, obviously I got super lucky and won like 20 bucks. <laughs> for like a 18 year old college kid, you know, and I was like, it was a cool thing. And then, uh, but I always was like, I always played sports. I was competitive. So after, uh, after finding poker, I wanted to get better. I wanted to improve. I wanted to beat my friends. And, um, so, you know, I played for fun around the campus for like a few months, like winning and losing a few dollars here and there. And then, um, started taking a little bit more seriously, 
started, you know, like playing uh, some games around town. I haven't heard of online poker there. Maybe I've heard of it, but I never tried it. And uh, so I actually started playing mostly live poker um, at the beginning, which is also different from a lot of people who uh, played like a free roll or put like 10 bucks online and really from there. I actually started playing live poker in the Maryland poker scene. Yeah, I started playing live poker too on the uh, cruises to nowhere down in Florida. Yeah. What'd you do to improve your game at that point? Was it just buying some books, reading some books? <laughs> Yeah, um, not so much books actually. I mean, I did. I bought me about like one or two books, but um, they don't. They didn't really have a lasting impression on me. If I remember, um, mostly it was uh, I think like some online forums, like Two Plus Two, were getting more popular then. Um, I lurked on there a little bit. I talked with um, you know some friends who were not specific, especially good at poker, but we talked our own strategy, tried to build our own uh, stuff from there. I mean, obviously, I was. Not very good back then, but neither was anybody else. So it kind of worked out for a while. And then yeah. <laughs> it just kind of went from there. How did you transition from, from playing live to online? Like, was there a moment when you realized like, oh, wow, I can, I can, I can spend my time doing this. It's going to be a very profitable way to, to make a living. Yeah. Um, I jumped into online just to dabble with it for a small amounts of money here and there at the beginning. I think maybe when I was like, towards my end of my freshman year of college, well, not, not college, freshman year of a, well, yeah, UMBC. I won like a $30 tournament for a few thousand dollars. And I, that was just a huge amount of money to be then. And I was, I was like, wow, like, you can actually make money online poker instead of like when you're losing like 10 bucks like I was before. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, that got me pretty excited. Um, I was still playing some live, some online, kind of like mixing the two. I, but I had some friends who were very successful online. And, uh, so I... I knew it could be done. Were they just random people that you happened across? Were they guys from 2 Plus 2? Where did you meet these guys? There were some guys around the Maryland poker scene that I had mainly met playing the, the home games in Maryland. Some of the guys, I guess by this time I'd been playing maybe some like 2 5 and 5 10, like the home games. And a couple of the guys were uh, playing pretty big online, like it's on Ultimate Bet back then. How like big? They were playing like the. Uh, maybe like a quarter 50, even up to like 50, 100, like they're playing like really big. And I was yeah. like, wow, like this is like cra- crazy amount of money to play for. And seemed, uh, <laughs> seemed like a different universe back then for sure. Battling but, against um, the Prolod Friedmans. Yeah. Yeah. That was about right, right back in the, right in the Prolod days, the, the heyday of, uh, <laughs> of all UB. that action. <laughs> yeah. Yep, definitely. Probably some guys that got, got scammed by the, uh, the super user back in the day too. Definitely um, possible. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, <laughs> if they got scammed in there or not personally, but, um, but yeah, those are some crazy, uh, wild, wild West days of online poker. They, they certainly were. So, you know, you, you see that that is possible and you're actually, you know, you're not playing small stakes yourself. Let's lead into black Friday, lead into like, what, what were you doing? What stakes were you playing? What was your outlook on poker at that time? Yeah. So black Friday, I was, um, I was mostly playing online tournaments around that time. At that time I met, um, pretty group of friends I was pretty close to through like going to the world series and some people I had known from Maryland. Like I played a lot of online. Yeah. Like, um, like some of my best friends, uh, Michael Katz, uh, Shannon Shore, Adam Geyer. And, uh, of course, like you said, you interviewed Jonathan Little yesterday. Some okay um, people to have in your tribe. Some uh, very, very <laughs> good people to talk some poker with. Um, so yeah, so I was like, uh, hanging out with them in Vegas. And then when I was at home in Maryland, I would play online. Sometimes I'll go to drive up to Atlantic city and play the Borgata events and play some cash games up there. And, um, so, you know, I was living in Northern Virginia with a few roommates at the time. Life was pretty like, I don't know, life was pretty simple, like nothing too crazy, but I had always kind of, even before black Friday, I kind of wanted to try something different get out of Maryland. I always liked the idea of California. I've been to commerce a few times, you know, the action was pretty fun. I just liked the West coast lifestyle. So, so I, saw, I, I was thinking about moving to California anyway, and then Black Friday happened, and uh, I had to decide what I wanted to do, if I wanted to continue playing poker, if I wanted to go somewhere else like California, Vegas, Florida was an option. And I decided to expedite my trip to California and just, I went to the World Series that's, that summer, and then right after the World Series, I didn't even go back to Maryland, I just drove straight to California <laughs> and uh, <laughs> had all my stuff back in Maryland. I think I paid some friends to like, move all my stuff out and put it into storage and take it to my parents' <laughs> house or something. <laughs> and I basically, I just stayed out there until, uh, until I figured things out. 
that did, that's awesome. Did you have any thoughts about quitting poker, doing something else? Uh, yeah, I have um, not necessarily on just that occasion, but yeah, I've had a few thoughts of quitting poker throughout my life. You know, I think uh, anybody who's played poker long enough, like as long as we have, has uh, gone through some existential thoughts about what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, you know, especially, obviously it's one where you're winning, but you know, especially if you're going through a downswing, you're going to go through like a lot of reflection about why you're here and what you're doing. But, um, but you know, so I, I went through a phase more than once, but, um, but you know, overall, like I've been extremely lucky. I've been extremely happy about my journey. Um, I'm happy that I played poker and the opportunities it's given me. So yeah, I, I definitely don't have any regrets, but I've definitely thought about different paths. Do you, do you think that playing cards is something you, you'll be doing for the remainder of your life? Or do you think you'll, you'll transition to something else? I think cards will always have a, be a part of me. I don't think I'll ever get tired of playing cards. Like even if it's just for recreational purposes, like um, I don't necessarily think that I'll be playing poker for a living like 20 years from now or something like that. It's possible, but definitely not like a certainty. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I like the competition. Like I, I enjoy poker. Like some people say, like some people say they get burnt down and never want to play again. And I think, uh, after a while, like I might not want to play the volume that I'm currently playing, but I think I'll always like enjoy going to play. Like, I mean, it's especially for sure. Like the main event each year, as long as I can like get it in. And then, you know, just like to have competition, the camaraderie, um, even in live poker, which is like, I, I like the, uh, social interaction in live poker. You meet some interesting people. Which is also why part of the reason I think I was drawn to live poker. I mean, obviously it's also softer, but um, but yeah, there's things about poker that I really enjoy that I think I'll be continuing to do for the rest of my life. Awesome, and I would expect nothing nothing less from you, sir. Especially somebody who spends so much of their time battling, you know. And you're right, like the the roller coasters, <laughs> the roller coaster of poker. I I don't think think there's a poker player alive that hasn't at one point just kind of throwing their hands up in the air and just like, you know, fuck this. Like, why am I doing this to myself all the time? Right. And typically it uh, coincides with the downswings. Um, (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) But uh, I know too, that that you have spent a ton of time studying the psychology behind the game. Would you like to, or just psychology of human beings in general, would you like to get into that and why that fascinates you so much? Definitely. Um, psychology has always interested me just, um, just starting with like classes in high school and college, you know, throughout all through poker. Um, you know, it's, it's something that is not talked about, I think, uh, enough, just mainstream in society in general, not just in the world of poker about the ups and downs that people go through on a daily basis. But, um, I think in poker, it's even exaggerated because the stress factors that can come in, you know, like, in a regular job, obviously, you can't go and then come home with less money than you started with. It's really, uh, it can be an extremely stressful situation for a lot of people. And um, and it affects the people that are you might, the average person might perceive from the outside as are crushing and have not a care in the world. It definitely affects the people at the highest levels, best players, even the most sound and normal people are, are not immune from the uh, psychological ups and downs of, uh, of poker or life in general. So, um, yeah. It's uh, n- n- neither am I. Of course, I've gone through my plenty of ups and downs, and I think it's a fascinating and important part of a, uh, a life that we need to pay more attention to. And I will say, from personal experience, having you know battled Jesse on the felt, th- he's a stoic dude. You look at him; it it feels like it feels like nothing's going to affect him, regardless of what happens, right? So, uh, from the outside looking in, it looks like you know, you're as strong as they come as, you know, in, in the poker field. But that's been my experience. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, that, is, that is the image I'm uh, usually trying to convey on the film. That, that, that nothing is affecting me. <laughs> it also feels good that you struggle too. Like, uh, <laughs> maybe not for you, but I mean, it's, it's comforting to know that, yeah, like everybody struggles regardless of how stoic they might seem. Poker is a brutal game and it's going to affect you emotionally and mentally and you just have to learn how to deal with it. You can't get around it. You can't avoid it. It's just going to happen 100% no matter who you are. 
I agree. And I think there's ways to improve it. You can, um, I don't, I don't know if anyone can completely just solve their, solve like the mental aspect of it, but there's ways you can tackle it from a perspective of like being healthier and stronger mentally. You can do meditation, you can do physical fitness, you can just be a, you lead a healthy, fulfilling lifestyle. And if, if you can find a way to do that, um, you can like have a more balanced. I know people, I know some friends who started doing volunteer big brother programs, stuff that they find more fulfilling outside of poker to kind of give them a perspective on when things go bad at the felt or when they're wondering what, what are they doing in their life? Like it gives them a more of a balance and uh, they don't, it doesn't drive them as crazy when things don't go as well. Right. And that existential crisis that you talked about, in my view, in my experience, and all I have is like a sample size of one, right? So I can't really apply it to everybody. But in my experience, there's a lot of times where fulfillment, especially as a cash game poker player, can be lacking. And you can, I, I, I would have these questions in my head, like, am I just taking from the world? Like, what am I giving back to society, humanity, the world? And um, so even on an upswing, even when things are going well, I still have these questions in my head. And finding fulfillment outside of poker, uh, not having your identity completely wrapped up as a poker player is just super healthy thing to do if you're spending a lot of time playing cards and um, can give your life balance and, and more meaning. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I mean, and I'm not, we're not the first poker players to feel this. I think every poker player has felt this at some point, and we're definitely not the first people to talk about it either. But, uh, but I think it, it uh, definitely like is important to reiterate it and um, just think about it because it is an important thing. And um, I think we won't, there'll be plenty of people after us who go through this exact same thing <laughs> playing poker. I'm sure it's, it's not like a cycle that's going to die. So uh, yeah, so yeah, I think it's, it's definitely important to just hammer to point home and create awareness. Yeah. Definitely create, create, create awareness. awareness. So. so speaking of all these things that you do that uh, help you feel better mentally, let's, let's, can we, break that down as specific as possible as far as the processes. Like you mentioned uh, exercise, eating healthy, meditation. What does that look like for you in your daily practice? You know, I definitely go through my ups and downs. And uh, when you're like in your downs, it's harder to keep these these habits up for sure. And I've gone through uh, some streaks where definitely gone off the wagon. See, for me, I, I try to keep, keep reasonably healthy. I don't keep myself to like a super strict diet or workout plan or anything. So I like to have some flexibility. That is the reason I play poker. But, um, but actually my, uh, uh, my girlfriend is uh, super into, she's great. She's super into meditation. She works for a meditation company and um, she's been a great motivator and insight for my mental health in that aspect. And then I try to, uh, I try to do some reading, some insights some research when I can, different topics. Um, and then, you know, like I wouldn't say I'm the healthiest, most fit guy, but I think I'm above average. So I think as long as you keep like a, a reasonable baseline that you're happy with, then uh, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. And so going back to your girlfriend, does she do guided meditations like in her job? What is that? What does her impact on you kind of look like? So I have tried meditation like before by myself with middling mixing, mixing results, I guess I had had some great, like great benefits from it, but then I would fall away from it. I'd have a hard time getting into it, but I think, um, I don't know. Like I watch her, I watch what she gets out of it and she like, it's, it's changed like her mindset or like outlook on life, just changed your life in lots of great ways. And so I know the benefits that I could get out of it. If I, um, if I put my mind to it, and when I do have a, when I do meditate, which is not as often as it should be, it might be like a couple times a week right now, but it, I think, I, th I think it'd be nice to get into like a daily, daily practice. You don't have to do it for hours every day. If, if some people, that's some people's thing. And if it works for you, that's great. But I think if you do it, you know, 15 minutes in the morning or something, it's kind of the same thing as going for a jog or you know, do a really quick, quick workout. It's, it's something that can uh, have a really lasting impact on your day if you can get into a habit. For sure. It's kind of like, and I've been into meditation um, for a number of years as well. The daily practice aspect of it is hard, right? There's so many known benefits of meditation, like just as far as improving mental health, improving quality of life and all of these things. 
but even no, even with that knowledge, doing it every day is tough. And in my yes. opinion, the reason that it's tough is that like, you know, physically, when you're making yourself physically stronger, you have to lift weights, you, you push yourself. And it's, it's not a super fun process, <laughs> uh, lifting more <laughs> weights than you think you're capable of. Um, yeah. It's a struggle. And meditation, it can also be a struggle, like maintaining focus and clarity, staying in the moment while your brain is going just batshit crazy, thinking about a million different things, having um, awareness of that c- can be tough. And I, and I think because of that difficulty, we struggle. You know, we're like, ah, I should meditate. But then you're like, ah, I, I don't want to. And that is because it's hard, right? It's a, it's a hard thing that you're doing. You're effectively strengthening your awareness, which, which is tough. But uh, yeah, the, the benefits are just out of this world if you can do it on a, a daily, regular basis. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, uh, you know, like some people, it's not like that for everyone. I think like most people are like you and I where just getting into it, just the idea of going to the gym is the hardest part. Once you get there, it's okay. Or like just starting your meditation is the hardest part. Once you get into it, you feel great. And afterwards you feel great after doing both of those things. And uh, some people can, can't wait to do it. Can't wait to go to the gym. <laughs> love the whole thing. Yeah. Love, like can't wait to meditate. And you know, like maybe I will get there at some point, but I'm not there right now. But um, my- I do, I do try and I, I, I always feel great afterwards and I always ask myself, why don't you just want to do it when you know you're going to feel so great afterwards, but it's not, it's not yeah. that simple sometimes. It's yeah. definitely not that simple. And my brain can be a real son of a bitch. Like my, I, can, I, I have learned over time that, for instance, here's something that I've learned, that I can wake up and I, 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 I feel tired, right? Like maybe I didn't feel like I slept well, I feel like my, my brain's telling me I, my energy levels are not super high. Um, nah, maybe you should just skip the gym, Brad. Maybe you should just do something else. Uh, just relax. Just watch some TV, you know, um, take it easy. And then I'll go to the gym. And despite what my brain telling me that I don't have enough energy, my body is completely different. My body is like ready to go and ready to rock and feels great. So just having the awareness that, you know, your brain can trick you into thinking you're not capable of going to the gym or just telling you this internal narrative that you don't, you don't have enough energy. You don't feel like it, you know, just it's lying to you. Um, if you can get to the point to where you recognize that, Hey, my brain's lying to me. Um, this is what I need to do. And then you go do it. That to me was a big realization that helped me maintain better habits uh, on a daily basis. I definitely agree. And uh, as, as humans, we are actually, we're terrible at knowing what we want, whether it's, uh, whether it's going to work out or whether what's what we want that'll make us happy, what kind of like, you know, you might think this thing that this person's going to make you happy, this concert's going to make you happy, you do it and you're always very, dis- often you're very disappointed. Like our brains are constantly lying to us and, um, you know, that's just the way it is. And, uh, if you can find the inner motive, the inner power to really realize, be rational and kind of force yourself to do things that are going to make you happy and make you stronger and make you a better place, then it takes a long time to learn, but <laughs> you'll be better off for it for sure. Yeah. And this is a story that I've told many people. Uh, when I was at Commerce playing my 60 hours a week, you, you were the first guy that kind of brought me out of my shell. Um, we were sitting at the little Commerce bar. Uh, just talking and, and you're like, Hey, you know, let's go out. Let's, let's go do something. Um, let's have a drink. And I'm like, nah, man, like I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go to sleep. Cause I'm waking up at 7am and I'm playing for 10 hours and I don't want to go out of my, you know, go off my schedule. And you're like, no, no, come on, you're coming like that. That really, I, I remember that specifically. And it meant a lot to me because it, it was the first start of me developing friends in Los Angeles and a life outside of poker, which even though, I thought I didn't want to do it was much more fulfilling than the life that I had been living up to that point. It brought me a lot of happiness and joy. So I'm always grateful that, you know, you push me to me doing something I didn't necessarily want to do, but was good for me overall. Hey, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm glad uh, we had, we had some good times back then. I'm glad uh, <laughs> I could be a part of that. <laughs> yes, we did. One day, maybe we can resurrect the, uh, the, commerce basketball league. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, so I've been 
consuming a lot of marijuana lately before bed. And I've been realizing that I make connections when I'm high that I don't normally make. Now, this is not to say that I'm in a greater state of mind because I'm still an idiot like 95% of the way. But there's also insights that I get that I wouldn't have otherwise. And as far as mental health goes, I watched a documentary yesterday on psilocybin and magic mushrooms. And um, I was just wondering if you had any insights on those sort of drugs, uh, you know, experiential things that can improve your mindset, improve your mentality, maybe make you think about life in a different way. Do you have any experiences? So I think uh, I actually did some reading on it recently where um, there are some studies of psilocybin mentioned in a couple different books that I've read. And I definitely think that uh, they can have, I'm not so sure on like marijuana, but for sure psilocybin will have um, a strong effect on many people, a very lasting impact on many people. And I think it can have very positive effects on many people. I think it brings out the same feeling in the brain that a strong religious connection or a strong spiritual connection can um, can bring about. And uh, like from these studies back in before they start, before they banned the psilocybin studies, there was uh, all the studies, a lot of the results were extremely positive. These people, it changed their mindset. Like smokers could all of a sudden quit because they, they saw like the different, they saw the world in a different way, whereas they saw different um, priorities. Like they, they, felt, they felt more value to their life. They felt better connections to the people around them. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, especially psilocybin, maybe some LSD drugs like that, mind-altering drugs can... Um, can have some great effects. As far as marijuana, I'm not sure how the studies go on that. I'm sure like, so, uh, actually, I think it's different for everyone though. So for you, that's definitely buff. For me, I smoke, I just get paranoid. I don't really want to do anything. <laughs> I can't think. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, uh, it feels like the, the high is obviously still there, but, uh, but for example, my girlfriend can smoke and have these amazing conversations about the world and life and all these amazing thoughts. So it's different for everyone. So, um, so, so for you, I think it makes sense that you have these connections whether they're uh, true or just like, whether it feels just that way or after you actually have your connections. I mean, but it's definitely possible and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't count them out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a high likelihood of some delusion involved in the process. <laughs> However, yeah. there are things that I think about after the fact, you know, I, I write these down or I, or I, I document them and then I analyze them after the fact. And I, I have gotten some, just different insights, things. It's like my empathy gets amplified in a way. Mm -hmm. I can I can understand how people are thinking and how people are reacting and the emotions behind things just differently than I otherwise would. But um, as far as the psilocybin goes, it's like uh, I, it's very interesting to me. And I ran across the same thing that the research was very positive before the '60s, the '70s when uh, Nixon basically ended it all and yeah. uh, everything got demonized and now it's, I think it's making a comeback or maybe just in the circles that I communicate in and travel in. No, I, I think it is also making a comeback. Yeah, I have um, definitely some people that are happy, like 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 the drug, I think it's, think it's a, has a positive impact. And um, yeah, it seems like it's more common these days a little bit. They've also became, I think, they've at least proposed or it has been decriminalized in a couple of places. I think starting maybe in Denver and really there. Yeah. Nice. Need to go to Denver for a couple yeah, of they're, weeks. Uh, <laughs> they're a step ahead in terms of the, uh, <laughs> the drug game. It seems like. Yeah. I spoke with uh, a friend of mine, Adam Creek. He, he um, he's a Olympic gold medalist lives in Canada. And he was telling me that over the summer he experimented with LSD. Um, it's like LSD dash, M or something like that. It has like an extra molecule, which makes okay. it uh, quote unquote legal in Canada, but <laughs> um, basically just more unregulated. And it's exactly the same thing. Right. But he had positive things to say about it too. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's definitely a, like a, a field worth exploring. And um, I mean, obviously you want to, don't want to abuse it in moderation, but, um, but if you do it responsibly, I think uh, you can definitely have some benefits. Yeah, set setting an intention. Um, the three yeah, sure. the three things that you need to keep in mind if you try something like that. You need to be in a good set, a good setting, and have an intention going in. 
and do your research. Don't be a dummy and just assume your life is going to change by yourself doing it like five feet from traffic on the uh, interstate, you know? (laughs) Um, So what would you say is the, uh, the highest impact action that you've taken to improve your poker game? I think for a little bit there, I was stagnant. I was just kind of, um, I was wondering like, this is what I want to do. And I wasn't, when you're not committed to something, you're not going to take steps to improve it. So I wasn't studying for a little bit. I was just kind of going through the motions of, you know, I would go and I would play certain mid hours or I would play said tournaments. And then I would, you know, I'll just go home and I was going through the motions without actually trying to improve myself. And especially in this day's age in poker, if you're not improving yourself, you're getting left behind. Like people, there's lots of other people out there studying. The recreational players are studying. Everyone's trying to get better. I mean, it's a doggy dog world out there. And, um, and yeah, I wasn't, I was, I was getting left behind a little bit. So then, you know, I was like, I just, I had to be honest with myself. If I want to keep playing poker as a career, then I'm going to have to put the time in. So, you know, I started studying more, whether that be instructional videos, it could be solvers, it could be just talking with friends and going through different spots. Um, but yeah, I started putting in more time and I think the results have shown in the last few years. Um, I mean, I'm, I haven't won like a huge tournament or anything, but I think I feel like poker overall is going pretty well. Um, I can't complain. And um, I've been talking with friends, especially, and like I, f- I feel like our games are all very improving. And um, so, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know how to articulate it exactly right now, but yeah, I think I've been basically putting in a lot more time studying for sure. Right. And that's that's a major benefit even when you grow complacent after you've had success in poker that you still have these friends that you can talk to and just ha- having a network that's available to help you um that because basically if somebody crushes at poker um and loves poker then they like talking about it because that's what kind of what their life is consumed with so um just having those guys to talk to is hugely beneficial. It is definitely. And just to have, so even outside of just the strategy aspect, just to have someone who's going through the same stuff as you are in terms of the highs and the lows and the ups and downs, you know, like we all have, we all know what it feels like to get crushed in the day playing poker and, uh, you know, just having someone, some camaraderie there is uh, also very beneficial. For sure. And also having people that, you know, the brain, despite being like 3% of our mass consumes 25% of our daily energy, Like the brain is just a massive energy hog. And when you play cards all the time, you're expending a shit ton of energy. I mean, there's, you know, studies on people playing chess and tournaments and like throughout the course of a tournament, losing 30 or 40 pounds, right? Because they're expending so much mental energy. And that's something that people overlook. Um, You know, you play cards for five hours, you get done and you're like, oh, like my uh, online poker, like my head hurts. I I feel just like mush. And poker that's actually, players, uh, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say that's actually something that I didn't even like give enough credit to until somewhat recently is the uh, amount of mental energy it takes on you. Like, I would just I would play and then I'm I would start to feel tired, my brain feel like mush, and I'd just be like, "What are you doing?" Just snap out of it, just figure it out. And like until like somewhat recently, I guess I didn't give enough respect to how much uh, how draining it really is to your um, body overall, and how you can't just snap out of it. You have to give it to give it respect with the proper care. Yeah, you got to rejuvenate. You got to go yeah. sleep, take a nap, get away. But yeah, non non poker players are like, "What are you? You just sat in a chair for five hours straight. Like, how could you be tired?" I'm like, no, yeah. it's not. That's not how it works, man. I'm I'm doing other things. <laughs> it definitely um, looks like that from the outside. For sure. <laughs> yeah. What is up, you future star of poker? You, Coach Brad here, and I just wanted to take a moment to let you know about PKC Poker. If you're sitting there wondering why. Why is Coach Brad promoting this PKC Poker app thing? Allow me a moment to explain my why. Battling in cash games has been my livelihood for the past 15 years. It's how I survive and put food on the table, which makes it imperative that I either test out or seek qualified opinions on all of the poker platforms on the market. One juicy find can mean the difference between a meh year and an amazing family vacation in Hawaii kind of year. With that said, I've tried almost all the major poker apps on the market to date, and despite the hype about amazingly juicy games, I've come away from the experience unsatisfied. I was just never able 
to find amazing success against seemingly weak competition. And in one specific case, was getting outright destroyed by passive villains playing more than 50% of their hands. What the heck was going on? After many evenings sitting in the bathtub, wondering if I had lost it, I finally dug into the data and learned something that shouldn't have been too surprising to you. These dudes were colluding and super using their pants off. So I swore off those free money, decentralized devil apps and decided to go back to my more familiar streets of ignition. It was then that I was contacted by a good friend of mine who turned out to be the vice president of worldwide operations at PKC. Him and I had a long, in-depth conversation about security, the ecosystem, and the future direction of PKC, and he managed to convince me to give it a shot. That shot turned into an incredible six months with an hourly rate that's about five times what it would have been playing on any other US platform. As it turns out, I didn't forget how to play. I just needed a level playing field to return to my crushing weights. I have no doubt that you, my community, my audience is going to play poker somewhere. And I wanna be damn sure that you don't go through the pain and frustration I felt by messing around with any poker app besides PKC. This is why promoting PKC is a no brainer. I love my community and I wanna put you in the best position to succeed at this game that we both love so much. So if you'd like to join me in the streets of PKC, simply head to enhanceyouredge.com slash PKC and get your invite code to play. You must have an invite code and you must be 21 years of age or older. One more time, that's enhanceyouredge.com slash PKC. Best of luck and now on with the show. I know that you've, I don't want to say transitioned, but you're playing more PLO these days. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. My, uh, ma- most of my play, most of my cash game play is, is at PLO these days. And for somebody that's starting out playing poker, what game would you suggest they dive into and be, get fully involved? I would still recommend that they jump into No Limit Hold'em just because of the availability of the games at the low, low, lower stakes. You're not going to find that many PLO games. You can probably find a No Limit Hold'em game anywhere, any casino that offers it has a poker room. And because of that, there's also going to be a lot more weaker players. And also, it, it builds just kind of a fundamental of just how poker works, you know, how people are thinking, people are acting. I mean, they're, PLO and No Limit Hold'em are very different games, but a lot, some, a lot of the fundamentals like position, like playing out of the blinds, stuff like that are still, still apply. So um, I would still recommend you get a strong foundation of No Limit Hold'em before you branch out into other games. Yeah. Uh, also there's, you know, pot odds and fold equity and all yeah, these yeah, other, exactly. other things that just overlap. So then why did you, why, why did you make the switch to PLO from No Limit Hold'em? Um, part of it was just, I wanted to do something different. I was like, No Limit Hold'em, I've been playing for so many years. It's getting a little monotonous. I kind of just wanted to mix it up. Um, and the next most common game spread was PLO, at least the stakes that I wanted to play. I mean, those other games like, like I don't know, the mixed games take a long time to learn and they were only spread at like really high stakes or really low stakes. PLO, there were some like middling stakes where you could like learn the game, figure it out. And, uh, and you know, it was still big bet poker, which I liked. I liked the, uh, I like big bet poker. It's more fun. You can bluff people. So I decided to, you know, try it out for a little bit at first, kind of just to break the monotony. And then I actually enjoyed it. It's more fun. It's a little more gambly, um, but it brings out like other people that are a little bit more gambly. So I think it's, uh, I think it actually makes for a better um, cash game overall, as long as uh, you have the right list, right, right group of people together. And, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's becoming more popular these days also, which so I wanted to have an option to be able to play in whichever game I wanted to play, whichever game seemed best at the time. So um, yeah, I figured it'd be a good skill to learn and, and it's pretty fun. So. And I would say that you're pr- probably particularly well suited for it because of your, your innate mental strength. Because like you said, it can be more gambly. Uh, the variance can be a little higher. So on one side, people hate that aspect of it, but in the side, from the sense that you're strong, you're not going to go on tilt. You're going to continue playing your A game kind of regardless of what happens. That's a major benefit versus playing against somebody who completely falls apart and continues playing and goes on tilt. 
I, yeah, I would like to think so. I mean, there's definitely uh, it's easier to tilt in PLO. After, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't look at a Jack Deuce under the gun and think, oh, this is playable. No matter how tilted you are, you yeah. look at a shitty hand in PLO, it starts looking pretty nice. Everything looks pretty reasonable once you're a little <laughs> tilted in PLO. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's look at the the five seven um, five seven eight ten. With yeah. a suited eight, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I just had one one time. Let's try doing it. <laughs> I, won with, I won with this four months ago. Um, yeah. So what's, what's some common poker advice you hear that you completely disagree with? That I disagree with? Maybe being like too conservative with like games that you play. Like I, I don't, I never recommend like taking too big of a risk, but I think uh, if you actually want to move up or like do different things in poker than just play the same game you're playing right now for the rest of your life, then you know, take some gamble, some shots, you know, like if you see a good spot, go after it. I mean, I'm not saying play with your rent money or anything like that, but just be maybe just be a little bit less risk averse in some spots than a lot of people are. Um, and just, but up to a reasonable extent where if you lose, you can go back and kind of grind it back, you know? Yeah, not, not, don't take a shot like where you have four buy ins. Um, yeah. versus your, your regular stake. You know, you can take a shot, move up in a game that looks really good, lose, you know, four or five buy-ins and then move back down. But yeah, it sucks. But I mean, I think it's, uh, it's something, if you want to like change, if you want to move up in poker, I think it's something you have to do at some point. Yeah. You, you do have to take the risk and get out of your comfort zone. And like we said, don't go broke. Don't be an idiot, but yes, take a, take a man, manageable risk, right? Looking looking back uh, from the guy, like you said, eight years ago, is there any wisdom that you've learned from living in LA, playing the live scene, that you would give to that kid that moved to LA right at the end of Black Friday? Maybe just kind of uh, just be more in the moment, be more try and be more present, which is something I still struggle with. I still struggle with um, just being present sometimes and being in the moment. But like, but I would just tell him just to more appreciate what you have, you're like extremely fortunate to be in the situation, living in this great city, playing a card game for your living. Um, you know, so just don't let things bother you as much. I'm, I think I uh, definitely let the small swings, whether it's poker swings or some other frustrations in life get to me more back then. And then, um, so yeah, I'll tell them to see the big picture a little bit more. And also, you know, don't beat yourself up over, uh, over maybe the lack of the fulfillment aspect kind of where uh, I was always, struggling with like what am I contributing to the world and, you know like yeah there is that aspect of it and it's not something you should completely overlook but at the same time we're such a small blip in the his, in the history of the like humanity universe where we're going to look at it and um so you know don't beat yourself over too much as long as you're doing what you think is best doing what you're the best you can being the best person you can and um kind of just appreciate life and be present is what I would tell, what I would tell the, myself eight years ago <laughs> savor it savor the journey um, Plus the games were a lot better then. So fucking go play. <laughs> <laughs> go play a lot more poker. <laughs> yeah. Go win it while you can. <laughs> get off your ass, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, if you could wave a magic wand and uh, change one thing about either poker tournaments or cash games, what would it be? Cash games. I mean, I think it'd be better to create more action. I think uh, I think they're trending in the right direction. Like a lot of cash games now have an anti or a big blind anti some sort of that, just create more action. I think um, like a lot of the reason some of these no limit games are dried up is just like, getting like slow and everyone's just playing, everyone's just trying to out knit each other as a problem. I'm not saying I'm the wildest player in the world by any means, but I think like an anti would just liven up the game, creates, obviously creates more action, forces you to play more hands. So as far as cash games go, I think that's a, a change that we better, that's also is becoming, is coming into play and becoming more popular. Um, as far as tournaments, I don't know. I think I think the changes that they're ma- people are making are better. Like big blind anti, that's is pretty common in most tournaments now. I think it's a huge improvement. It saves a lot of time. The recreational player or someone sit there and watch a dealer make change every every single hand for two minutes. Um, no fighting over yeah, antis. Less, less fighting over who posted. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Was it Prahlad and Lissandro? Just got <laughs> yeah. the fist fight over that. <laughs> <laughs> Prahlad's yeah, come so- up twice in this conversation now, but yeah, they almost yeah, got exactly. a fist fight over an anti. <laughs> he's, yeah, so he's a good. I actually, I was, uh, I was on a basketball team with him uh, like a year or two ago. Though we had, we had some fun, so I, I didn't nice. bring that up. But he's a good guy. <laughs> um, 
your accumulated wisdom in, in your your journey yourself, what would you like to share with folks that you know they're hell bent on realizing their poker dreams? I would like to see what would I like to share. It's a lot of work. It's not all just fun and games. I mean, and you know, most people I think realize that to this point if they're like trying to seriously go a poker player, but but it really is a lot of work. You have to you have to take your risk seriously. You have to put in the time to study. It's taking time just to play. There's plenty of things you can't learn just by watching videos. You have to put in like the effort, and you're gonna have to be honest with yourself about how much you're gonna make. I mean, or how much time you have to put in. You can't just go and spend a bunch of money every night. I mean, some people can if they're winning enough, but the average person getting into poker isn't gonna be able to go and buy expensive dinners every night, go stay at expensive hotels every night. You're gonna have to. You have to be honest with yourself, and, and uh, if, if it's something that you're still interested in, and you think you think it's better than your other prospects, or you just really don't want to have anyone to respond to, no boss, something like that, then it's definitely not impossible. But I would say take a strong look at it before delving into it. Agreed. It's way harder um, from the inside <laughs> looking out than people yeah. think it is, <laughs> and they. It's very easy to become delusional in your prospects. Uh, as far as like a yearly earn rate. And it's really easy to be lazy too, right? I mean, let's, let's be blunt. Um, you mentioned earlier the flexibility, the autonomy that we have as poker players. It's a double-edged sword because it's great not having a boss, but you also don't have anybody telling you, hey, man, get your ass in gear. Like you need to study. You need to go play. Um, yeah. So being able to yeah. just be responsible. Yeah, and some people perform better when they have some structure somebody like telling them where they have to be at some time. And I mean, I'm not immune to that. Like some, I, I like some structure in my life. Like it's good to have like some schedule, some reasonable schedule, maybe not like every single day, but having a routine is pretty big for me. Otherwise I'll just kind of fall off and start. I don't know. I just won't play for like, you know, a week straight or something. If I like, if I fall off the cliff and then, uh, you know, which is also kind of why these days I don't play all night or anything like that anymore. I usually quit as a somewhat reasonable time. I like to have my mornings, as kind of just a structure in life. Whereas maybe like when you and I are playing a lot, like I would play till all hours in the morning, somewhat, somewhat frequently, nothing like not every night, but, and, um, but then my next day is ruined. I lose all sense of time and structure and, uh, overall in the long run, it's, it's I'm worse off for it. So, so yeah, it's, structure is kind of important. I've turned into an old man over the last four years. Like I'm in bed by 10 PM up by six 30, um, yeah. ready to rock and roll. And, and the only time that I've deviated from that, in like the last three years. The only time was I was in Cherokee playing a tournament and it went till, you know, 1230 or 1 a.m. And I found myself standing in line buying some freaking do Dunkin' Donuts at 1.30 mm -hmm. in the morning. And I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Like, and then just completely miserable the whole next day. Like, just couldn't get it together. Uh, so, I'm with you. Like I, I thrive with some structure. I don't want, you know, somebody, I, I don't want all of my time monopolized. Like I, I do love the flexibility. That's one of the, the reasons why I played Booker, but I, I've learned that I do thrive when I have some sort of accountability and structure in, in my days. What's your current big goal as related to your poker career? I don't know if I have a specific big goal right now. Like I think uh, when I was first starting poker, my big goal was to like play the biggest stakes. I wanted to like, I saw the games running on ultimate bet, 50, 50, 50, 100. I was like, Oh, I want to play that one day. But um, you know, I've played some, I don't play that regularly now, but I've played some reasonably big stakes in my life at this point. And I've played, you know, some good tournaments. Um, I've never won like a major title, which would be cool. Like, like a world series bracelet, WPT, something like that. But, um, but I'm not like dead. I'm not heartbroken if I never win one. I mean, I don't, I don't travel a tournament circuit nearly as much as I used to. So it's not like I'm giving myself all the chances in the world. I only play a handful of those a year, but uh, I mean, it'd be cool to win, but I don't think, I don't know if I have a specific goal right now besides just kind of enjoying poker and enjoying life at the same time and trying to be a, trying to balance the two in a happy medium and just basically living my life. I, uh, that reminds me of a story about you playing the main event over like a four year stretch. You played every year, you never cashed. And like every year you made day three, right? Like 
there was a <laughs> there was a stretch where I made day three every year and basically it was like a hundred off the money every year. And uh, actually, I still have never cashed the main event. Which is hilarious. <laughs> I'm either over ten or over eleven. I got double check, <laughs> but, uh, which is pretty funny variance. <laughs> yeah. You know, what can you do below? <laughs> You're basically you've probably played more hours in the main event than anybody else without cashing at this point. I mean, I've got to be a pretty big favorite. <laughs> Not a, it's, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah, not not something you really want on your resume, but it's still pretty funny. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, to me, I guess you're laughing about it, so it's funny to you too. Oh, it's funny. It's definitely funny. <laughs> um, what's a project you're working on now that's uh, near and dear to your heart? Project I'm working on. Or something you do on a regular Let's basis. See. You know, you mentioned I've, volunteering and stuff like that. Yeah, I've um. I, know, I picked up golf recently, which I know is not like the most <laughs> giving back to the world kind of thing, but I'm enjoying it. It's a, it's a competitive, it goes well with poker. I, I have some other friends that also are picked up golf recently. Um, so it's, uh, it's something I'm trying to improve on. Good that you're probably all in the same relative skill level too. It is cool. Yeah, actually. Uh, a lot of us are, I have a group of friends that I play with and we're all pretty similar. So it's a good time to get out there. But as, as far as some more uh, fulfilling projects I'm working on, I don't know. I've been trying to read a, wide, a fairly wide variety of things, everything pertaining from like books on mental health, which I read recently that we were talking about through like some novels, some, um, some other like, uh, also I read recently, recent books on society, uh, like how we are society. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to be a little bit more well-read than I used to be. Definitely still not a scholar or anything like that, but, uh, who is? But but trying to uh, expand my expand my uh, I don't know I guess knowledge a little bit. It, out of those books or any book that you've read, like if you could if you could gift one to the chasing poker greatness audience, what would you suggest? What would you gift? Um, there was a book I read several years ago called The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt, and. Um, I've read a lot of books since then, but this one still really stands out as one that uh, resonated with me. I recommended it to many people. My friend Garrett, who many people might know, is a, plays a lot of high stakes poker on streams. Um, also, he, he made it book. on Survivor. Yeah, he made it on Survivor um, <laughs> for a day, which, by the way, was the funniest episode of Survivor that I've ever seen. I don't watch <laughs> it, but that one specifically was. <laughs> it definitely made for good TV. <laughs> But um, but no, I think that's a, that's a very uh, very special book that resonated with me, and I would recommend that to anybody for sure. The Happiness Hypothesis. Yep, by a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, and it sound the title makes it sound like a self help book, like kind of corny, but but it's really not. It's more just about life perspective, like different like societal things, through perspectives on the world, and uh, yeah, it's a very good read. I would recommend it. These are my favorite kind of suggestions on a, a poker podcast: books that don't have anything to do with poker. But uh, just increase your, improve your outlook on life. You know, there, there are multiple things you can do to improve at poker. And not all of them involve sitting in front of a silly solver, putting a bunch of stuff in and waiting for it to spit an answer, answer out. You know, we've touched on meditation. We've touched on physical fit, fitness. You're, you know, your mind goes where your body takes it. So being strong physically helps you with mental strength. And being happy, I would say, helps you with your mental strength and helps you play poker well over extended periods of time. Oh, absolutely. It's very difficult to play good poker when you're irritated from something else in life. It easily bleeds through. And, oh, um, yeah. It magnif- again, talk about something that like magnifies or exaggerates. You know, if you're somewhat aggressive and shit's going down in your life, all of a sudden, every spot looks like a good raise. <laughs> like every things that are very marginal, you're going to lean towards aggression way more than you otherwise would. Yeah, poker is tough enough as it is. To come in, come into playing pre pre tilted is a uh, is not a winning strategy. <laughs> yeah, it's a recipe for disaster. You know, at, at the end of the day, and I know this is sort of a, a heavy question, but how, how would you like you know your friends, the people that you interact with, the poker community? How would you like them to, you know, think of Jesse Yaganuma? I think I would be happy if I just thought they just thought that I was like in generally a pretty like good person. I mean, nothing super, uh, super complicated. I just try to present myself to everyone like, you know, in a positive way. I try to interact in a positive way and bring some, 
bring some happiness to both of our lives if possible. Um, you know, I think I've mainly uh, connected pretty well with most people I've met throughout my life. I mean, of course, you're going to you're going to rub some people the wrong way and you're going <laughs> to connect much, much stronger with other people. But um, but in general, I think if they just view me as someone who's trying to do well, um, someone who doesn't doesn't mean harm, just trying to have fun and uh, trying to impact everyone's life in a positive way, then that will be happy with me. I know I'm not I'm not going out there like breaking any records on sports or break, having any crazy, uh, you know, theoretical physics breakthroughs or something like that. But, uh, you know, just want to be a simple person that brings some joy to the world. And again, I, I can only speak from a sample size of one, but that's certainly how I think of you. Just a good dude, a good dude that I was fortunate enough to cross paths with in my own perfect journey. Um, Thank you. Appreciate it. That's Likewise. My, my pleasure, man. I appreciate that too. Um, so where can the, uh, chasing poker greatness audience find you on the interwebs? If you want to be found, <laughs> uh, they can find me if they want. I don't post a whole lot these days, <laughs> but, um, on Twitter, I'm at Jesse Yags, J E S S E Y A G Z. I don't have an Instagram, so won't find me there, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, uh, occasionally might post something. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a whole, I don't have a whole lot of social media, but off, right off the, off the interwebs, we'll say commerce casino, right? That's, oh, that's a good interwebs. start. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll probably find me playing some cash games in commerce. You'll find me in, uh, several tournaments around the LA area. And, um, if you're there during the world series of poker, then you'll probably find me out there. All right, man. We'll, uh, let's get together at the WSOP next year. And For sure. this is, you know, been a great joy having you on, having this conversation. Let's, uh, let's do it again. Brad, thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. And I will uh, definitely do it again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, please take a moment to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. And once again, I also wanted to let you know about PKC Poker. If you're on the lookout for a new platform where the games are safe and secure and the action is amazing, head to enhanceyouredge.com slash PKC to get your code and jump into the games. You must have a code to play as well as be 21 years of age or older. One final time, that's enhanceyouredge.com slash PKC. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time on Chasing Poker Greatness.